glad you could join us this afternoon. We have a few people that are logging in right at the top of the hour here. This afternoon, we're going to share about our birds living on our shoreline. And we're going to learn a little bit about which birds are our local beach nesting birds and why are we concerned about them? What's going on? And uh, maybe a few conservation success stories as well today. But also, uh, what is Audubon doing to help these beach nesting birds is something we'll share quite a bit about today. And that of course leads to what you can do to help beach nesting birds, even if you don't live near the shoreline and uh, that going out and being a volunteer on the beach is something that we do have a good number of volunteers already, but these birds need help in other ways. So we'll share a little bit about that this afternoon too. So if you are interested in asking a question, we are sharing today in a webinar type format. So we've muted everyone else. And if you could find your way to the chat box, you can ask Kate Pratt. And also you'll see under the co-host list, Jillian Bell is also here. She uh, traded off days off. So I wasn't expecting her on when I made the slides for this program, but she's here to help out as well. They can also help you with any technical issues you're having with uh, using Zoom today. So if you're not hearing me very well, the slides aren't coming through, whatever it might be, messaging them first will be very helpful. I recognize a lot of the names here today, but I want to introduce myself. My name is Ken Elkins. I'm the Community Conservation Manager for Audubon, Connecticut. I have been with uh, Audubon, Connecticut for 12 years now, and I'm based at the red dot near the center southwest part of the state, the Audubon Center bent to the river. If you're familiar with Audubon, Connecticut, uh, and maybe not, well, our first Audubon Education Center in the country was Audubon Greenwich down in the southwest corner of the state. And we have uh, the largest baby bird nursery in Connecticut is based at the Audubon Sharon Center, which is in the northwest corner of the state. And the staff there also manage uh, thousands of acres of northeastern forest for our uh, forest nesting birds and also have programs where they're helping landowners to uh, figure out how they can help birds in their own backyards as well. And then we also uh, are concerned about coastal birds and we have over 400 acres of sanctuary in Guilford that is a salt marsh in the adjacent upland. So we are actively managing that area for a uh, future salt marsh. In the Bents of the River where I'm based and Kate is as well as uh, Jillian is in Southbury. Uh, and we have 15 miles of trails that are open still. Uh, so you can come and visit and get out and enjoy some of the bird sounds around us. So today we're going to be sharing about more about conservation than birding skills, really, that uh, to help protect all birds across North America, National Audubon has chosen five strategic priorities. Uh, we have bird-friendly communities is where uh, you usually hear me talking about. We also have a water program mostly in the west, but also the Delaware River and its watershed is critical for many birds. Working lands includes our forests work here in the Northeast, but also uh, where there's grazing out in the central part of the country and also in areas where there may be uh, resource, natural resources, mining and um, reclamation that we try and work on conserving birds in those unique habitats there. And climate is ultimately the number one uh, threat to birds. So we have a growing team working on how climate is impacting birds and what we can do to mitigate that. But also our coastal birds is one of our key strategies. And in Connecticut, we realize that Audubon, Connecticut doesn't have enough staff and resources to protect all of Connecticut's beach nesting birds. And instead we work in a collaboration with Connecticut Audubon Society, the Roger Torrey Peterson Institute, and uh, the three of us nonprofit organizations really work in supporting the work that is legally part of the Connecticut Department of Energy and Environmental Protection's Wildlife Division. 
and the Fish and Wildlife Service when there are federally threatened birds involved. Uh, so combined, we're able to train and uh, also coordinate a group of volunteers and we fundraise together to be able to support staffing this important work through the summer. We chose this week to be able to share about this because with the with Memorial Day in the beginning of June becoming the unofficial start of beach season, more and more people are going to be thinking about ways that they want to get out uh, and enjoy the summer weather and going to the beach is one of those. When we're there, we need to take note and remember that there are some birds who arrived back earlier in the season and they believe that the beach is their habitat. So we have some beach nesting birds and to clarify, these are birds that are nesting right out on the sand or on the bare, uh, up in the dunes above that uh, tide line. And some of them are on our barrier islands just off the shore. Uh, so for boaters are another group that we are trying to communicate how to help share the shorelines. So who are our beach nesting birds around us? First, I'll just introduce them that we have piping plovers, American oyster catchers, least terns, common terns, roseate terns, and black skimmers that are found here. Uh, some of them nest a little bit better further south, like the black skimmer, and the common tern and roseate tern nest more on our islands offshore, but they do spend a lot of time foraging and then resting on our beaches. So who are they up close? Uh, Here's the piping clover. Notice how their backs are amazingly camouflaged with the slightly wet sand of our beaches. And here we have a parent with a uh, recently hatched young. And I am reminded that this photo is not my photo. I love watching birds. I love showing birds to people, but I do not have the patience nor the skill for bird photography myself. So the photos you're about to see, some of them are from our monitors or volunteers, and most of them uh, are from entries in the Audubon Photography Awards. Uh, when we talk later on about what you can do, some of it is also that these photographers have amazing equipment, and please don't attempt trying to recreate these photos on your own. Uh, we would be too close to the birds. Uh, these photographers were at quite a distance away. So back to the, whoops. The piping plovers, uh, they are uh, only about eight inches tall. They're kind of a shorter bird and they have a unique uh, niche in which they are finding birds right on the high tide line, is what start finding food along the high tide line and just above it. So they live a life right near the tides changing and uh, are well adapted, especially with that camouflage to be able to survive in that environment. And knowing how these birds act is important for us to know how we're able to protect them better. Oyster catchers, which I know at least one of our visitors today, George, said that's their favorite bird when they visit the shoreline, have those unique bright orange beaks and the dark brown backs and black heads. And if you get to see them up close enough, that yellow eye with the red uh, eye ring around it, they're just an absolutely striking bird, very large for a shorebird that uh, they stand close to two feet tall, wingspan over two feet wide, and here are, here is a family group with two young that ha, are at least a couple weeks old. They use those beaks for being able to break open some shellfish, but they also will pick and eat lots of crabs and small invertebrates along our shoreline as well. Oyster catchers tend to nest out further away from people. So if they're on a barrier beach, it's usually out almost what would be a peninsula or on a um, barrier island and the majority of them in Connecticut uh, nest on just offshore islands. Nesting up on the dunes higher are least terns. Least terns can be distinguished from any of the other terns around because for us here in the Northeast, it is the only one with a yellow beak. Also, as the name suggests, they are much smaller than the rest of our terns uh, that are here in the Northeast. They are colonial nesters. We'll talk more about that in a moment. And they also nest much later in the season than the other beach nesting birds. So uh, they are even 
more susceptible to human activity because they're out there on their nests at the peak time of human activity on the beaches as well. Uh, you can recognize them also, their flight pattern when they're coming over you, that they've got a little bit more floppy wings. The other terns are uh, much more jet-like in their approaches and uh, glide a lot more. And they also have a two-noted kind of pipping sound that they'll let you know that you might be too close to their area as well. Common terns. This photo here doesn't really represent the full size of a common turd well. Wingspan of about three feet. They, with their tails, are good eight, 20 inches long, almost 24 inches long. Gorgeous orange beak with a black tip. And distinguishing them from the other turns you might see is that their bellies and their underside is slightly gray. You might think that it's just dirty from the sand or it's a little bit wet in this photo, but they are slightly grayish underneath and not pure white like many of our other turns that we might see. Roseate terns are federally uh, threatened species. They nest on the isle larger islands out in Long Island Sound on particular Faulkner's Island and Plum Island. And uh, they have a much longer white tail, white underneath. And when we see them this time of year, their beaks are nearly all black. So if we're seeing them at an appropriate distance, we're only seeing that all black bill. Uh, and they look a little bit thinner than the other terns. So when we see them on a jetty with say common terns, that big long white tail sticks out and also seeing a black bill compared to the all reddish orange bills helps us find them and distinguish them from the other turns pretty quickly. And then one of the most interesting birds to watch by behavior is the black skimmer. They are an irregular nester in Connecticut. I wish they nested here more often. They do nest very nearby on Long Island and uh, actually at the edge of um, on the southern side of Long Island in particular near Jamaica Bay. Wildlife Refuge, there are nesting colonies of them there as well. With that unique behavior of a long lower mandible that they are able to notice when there is prey next to their bill and snap it up and they just glide along the surface to be able to find their food. Knowing why some of these birds are in trouble and what we can do to help them is to learn about their behaviors. The terns are colonial nesting species, so they're able to help each other out by nesting right near each other and giving alarms and they can also protect their nests as a group. So while some of them are feeding, other adults are protecting their nests and young from any predators and disturbances. And other species like the plovers and the oyster catchers are territorial, so each pair needs a separate space along the beach before another pair is able to use that section of beach. Uh, so we need to have more space sometimes for less birds because of that territorial behavior they have. One of our first concerns is that their eggs look like gravel. So if they're not marked, their nests can very easily be uh, not and can be unnoticed and people unfortunately might step on them or in larger beach sections they might drive on them. We don't do that much in Connecticut on our beaches but it is a concern in other sections of uh, their, their range in particular. So uh, knowing what the eggs look like and that their nests are simply what we call a scrape that they have just gently dug out a little bit of the sand and it's maybe some rocks around. The ones on the right, you don't even see any rocks. Oyster catchers sometimes will find their way up into the rocky shoreline and have a more protected nest here. Uh, and they usually only have one egg, sometimes two which then makes their success rate even more important to make sure that those young are able to fledge. Incubation of those eggs usually takes uh, two to three weeks for many of our beach nesting birds. And once the young have hatched, most of them are what we call uh, precocial, 
which means that they are covered in down and they are able to walk and feed themselves very, very quickly. The terns and the oyster catchers, we consider them to be semi-precocial, which means that yes, they're covered in down, they can move a little bit immediately, uh, but they are not, uh, but they are absolutely reliant on their parents for food to begin with. So here we have oyster catchers with a young, very mobile right away, but they need their parents to find them small edible pieces of food that they can get their beaks around like this small little piece of crab. And we need to be careful during the chick season on the beach because one of their number one behaviors is that the young will uh, squat down. They will absolutely flatten out to look like their habitat, to camouflage as their best defense rather than running away. So they will, uh, they could be in danger of being trampled if we're not careful. This one is very young. You can even see the egg tooth there on the tip of the beak still. While they can be out and about on their own, we do need to remember that they need their parents nearby because on hot sunny days, and I apologize for the text or the photo here, um, they need protection from the hot sun and they will roost underneath their parents. And if their parents are running away, uh, doing distraction displays of being disturbed too much, then the young can become stressed out physically and health-wise uh, from the heat in particular. And these young with the precocial members of the terns and the oyster catchers need help feeding from their parents. So the, there needs to be an abundant supply of forage fish. So these young, uh, small minnow type fish uh, are a conservation concern. And that's something that some of our Audubon partners are working on. And you'll actually hear some more about some opportunities uh, in Connecticut actually to help with uh, forage fish this summer. And here's another shot of the oyster catchers eating a small crab. If only they could find all those uh, Japanese shore crabs, the invasive ones and uh, get them off of our shorelines for us, that would be wonderful. So which of these species is threatened and in which category? The piping clover and the roseate terns are federally threatened and they are also state listed. S having federal uh, uh, listing means that there is federal protections and technically if any of them are, if there's a death of any of these species which includes their eggs, uh, being taken, then uh, there can be legal consequences for that. As far as the state listed species, there is less legal protection, but there is instead, there's more of a focus on the conservation side of these species and also uh, development projects and things like that need to be reconsidered if it's involving a state listed species. So at the Connecticut level, the common tern, the American oyster catcher and least terns are all listed that across the country, their populations are at a level that they are not considered federally threatened. But here in Connecticut, we do uh, have a conservation concern for them and they are listed here. Throughout this time, if you have a question, feel free to add those to the chat box and we will uh, answer those questions as we go along. I see right now, uh, we, Jan Collins asked if any of these photos are from Paul Fusco. He is the state uh, photographer for Connecticut's uh, Wildlife Division. And no, he does share a lot of photos with Audubon, uh, but in this case, I'm not choosing to use any of his photos. Uh, the most amazing ones were all Audubon Photography Award winners, and one or two might be from Scott Kroibosch, who works for the uh, Roger Tory Peterson Institute, one of our partners in the Audubon Alliance for Coastal Waterbirds. But feel free to add those questions at any point so we don't forget them when we get to the end. So what are the reasons why these birds have become threatened uh, and nearly endangered? One of them is development, that we have highways, we have train right-of-ways, and we have buildings right up against areas that used to be nesting habitat for them. 
And the other is recreation, is humans love going near the beach and therefore sharing the same habitat is something that we need to learn how to balance a bit more. Because when humans are at the beach, that activity can disturb them. Uh, our vehicles on the beach, we're not able to see these very well camouflaged young and eggs in particular. Uh, and we can also disturb the adults so much that they abandon an area. And dogs might love the water, they might not care about birds whatsoever, but all of these birds see dogs as potential predators. And they will immediately go into protection behaviors and ignore feeding or foraging for their young and uh, actively protecting their young from the heat of the day are all concerns when people bring their dogs to the beach during the summer. Human activity also brings predators to the beach. That some of our barrier beaches, there's also vegetation nearby where raccoons can roost during the day and come out at night. Red foxes are certainly a concern for some of our birds, especially oyster catcher and least turn nests in the wrong locations. Uh, and uh, feral cats are a major concern in many of our beach nesting areas as well. There are some more natural predators as well, things like crows. Now we have ravens nesting near the beach and the gulls are also a concern. One of the first things that Audubon and DEEP can do is that for the piping plover in particular, we can build exclosures, that their nests are on the beach, the birds are small enough and when they leave the nest, they tend to walk, they don't fly. That is not one of their first choices of behavior is to fly away. Instead, they will walk and run away. So these exclosures can be covered over the top and therefore the nest is protected from predators like the foxes and raccoons. And also it gives just enough space so that human activity near the nest can help them at least through this critical time of incubating the young. Finding that nest inside, we should stay quite a distance away Sadly, I've been out on these beaches and people think it's become an exhibit at the zoo and their hands are on the cage looking in and they don't see anything because the adult has run out the other side away from them and now there are only those camouflaged eggs in the nest. And we know that if it's too hot or too cold of a day during this nesting season, that's important that we don't disturb them off of their nest. So it is pretty amazing to get to see them when we can at a distance. A new project that we've only been doing for two years is banding the American oyster catchers by learning more about which if they are returning to the same beach sites every year as individuals or are they choosing new ones and if they are choosing the same site we can start to take some physical characteristics of that beach to learn why they prefer that more so we might be able to duplicate more of that potential habitat for them in the future uh, and also we're learning where they go for the winter one of our birds banded in Connecticut last year was found in El Salvador overwintering this uh, past winter. So that's pretty exciting to hear that. We haven't been able to band all that many oyster catchers yet. It's not the easiest task in the world. They are quite uh, reluctant to come near humans. So we have to come up with another scenario to be able to catch them. And to be able to band them, what we do is we have these uh, uh, nets that are there to uh, be mechanically moved over. And you can see the two decoys there that we put decoys in their territory and they might come and become territorial against those decoys. We are lucky enough that these decoys were made by a world master carver um, and he donated those to uh, Audubon to be able to continue this work. But on to some other challenges. Another one is trash. The trash leads to all those predators visiting the beach. And it could end up with becoming uh, mistaken as food in many cases. So uh, it is another major concern of ours uh, that lead to the other problems. We do have 
Another program that we have is that before the exclosures go up and for our other birds, we have this uh, flagging fencing that it is simply a rope with flagging on it so people can see it. And it is a guide of a minimum area that we have designated for nesting for the birds to use and roosting for them. It is not the ideal spot to go. That if you do go to visit our beaches, we ask that you still keep as close to the tide line as possible. And going up to the string fencing to then try and find the birds is become a major concern and our volunteers and monitors out there this season are uh, continually taking photos of birders and photographers trying to get their own best photos uh, with smaller equipment and they're doing it by being right up against this fencing and uh, we are we have unfortunately lost some uh, American oyster catcher nests and chicks already this season from uh, human disturbance and we believe we lost at least one piping plover nest from uh, disturbance this season as well. So this fencing is there as a signal of a distance to use, but it, um, it um, is a bit symbolic. It isn't the line that we wish we could use, but legally this is the best we can do for the birds. We also have signage out. Uh, and this official signage that we place with the logos of our organizations on it uh, just like a lot of other things out there, especially when there's a government logo on it, a lot of people question it or ignore it. Uh, so the signage is somewhat useful, but we have found one way that signage can be more effective. And we've actually done research on this the past few years in areas like North Carolina and New York, besides in Connecticut, is that we are now working with children to place their own uh, signage that they are drawing them in their classes and we are then able to e recreate their signage on these larger uh, weatherproof signs and sometimes it's a matter of just laminating their artwork and putting it out there and uh, these signs made by children are torn down statistically a lot less often than if it's one of our official government created signs. Uh, so Audubon has been working with classrooms, especially on Long Island, uh, that where there's a lot of other beach nesting birds. So our team in Audubon, New York, and also our team from Audubon Greenwich is working with classrooms. The children learn these most common beach nesting birds in class. They learn their ecology. They learn about uh, animal uh, adaptations, how their beaks work and uh, other things that they should be learning in science already. And it then is motivating them to create this signage. And in some cases, the students get to have field trips out to be able to place that signage out. And now there's an even newer level of um, ownership of the project that they will then bring their families out. And more and more people are learning about the importance of how we need to behave with birds. So education is another key component of helping to conserve these birds, that if more people knew how to act on the beach, we would then be able to uh, hopefully save more of them in the future. So we have volunteers out uh, as part of the monitoring. We also, uh, they are sharing uh, with the jet skiers, the windsurfers, and other beachgoers uh, what are the best ways we can as humans help protect those birds and other colleagues are visiting more and more classrooms because as the kids learn about it they're able to share about it at home and we've worked on other signage in certain areas uh, in particular one that has opened up the past few years is on the right is Pleasure Beach in Bridgeport was historically an amazing city park. It was the Coney Island of Bridgeport decades ago, uh, and it had become run down. Uh, it had lost access because of a bridge burning down. So it, now there is water taxis to visit the beach again. And as it reopened and things were uh, cleaned up, we were able to uh, also add more signage and create more programs for educating the visitors of Pleasure Beach because with over a decade of 
uh, reduction in human activity out there, the birds really found this area to be valuable. Our, I mentioned a moment ago the monitors that are visiting on uh, our beaches and we train them during workshops and this year we did them like this in Zoom in March and we train them on the behaviors to watch to locate pairs in appropriate habitat. Uh, then they are helping us with finding the original nests so that we can get exclosures up over the uh, and change the string fencing as needed. So we had monitors just this past weekend found a new oyster catcher nest and within hours we had new string fencing protecting that section of the beach. So it was a team effort to get out there on what was typically a day off for mo most of us that other colleagues were able to hear the call and got out there. Uh, and then uh, tracking the nesting success. So they have spotting scopes and for some of them we have gotten grants to make sure that the key volunteers have the optics that they need to be able to monitor the birds from a safe distance. And we are also then tracking fledging success. And this is critical. Uh, and this is where we have had success because uh, Last year, we had a record high number of American oyster catchers fledging in Connecticut. Uh, we had 74 pairs and we had 64 young fledged. So that is a uh, best ever for a percentage of uh, young and the highest number of actual individuals leaving the nest. Our piping plovers were also close to a record high with uh, 57 pairs and they fledged 98 young. So uh, that was another great year for them. I mentioned Pleasure Beach a moment ago, and when uh, we saw the reopening of this park, we pictured uh, Bridgeport residents coming to enjoy their city park, and they probably did not want to hear from a bunch of generally older white and usually men out there doing the uh, conservation work to hear us say stay off the beach because this is for the birds. So we rethought the program and we created the wildlife guards in which we train uh, students from Bridgeport, Stratford, and West Haven to become Audubon employees for the summer. And they are taught how to do that monitoring of uh, watching the nests and counting the fledglings and they are also then learning the techniques from our Audubon staff on becoming environmental educators. They also then help with urban ecology projects as well, uh, plantings at some of our city schools in particular. On the weekends, they are there as one of the first things that the uh, visitors of Pleasure Beach meet when they are reaching the beach and we let the kids borrow the binoculars for a moment and the teens have created their own games for the visitors to do. They quite often you can see behind them almost a kiddie pool that they will go and net and collect some of the uh, beach animals and uh, help everyone learn to appreciate the nature that is there, that it's not just there as a uh, human uh, entertainment park. Uh, and then we uh, have the chance for uh, them to grow into these positions. And we started the program eight years ago. And uh, every year we've had a few of the students uh, return. They've become our uh, crew leaders, our, so they've grown into supervisory roles. And we have a growing number of them that are choosing uh, majors in college related to the environment uh, two of them actually came back last January and asked if they could volunteer during their break, uh, that they wanted to stay connected with us and stay connected with uh, skills to build their careers in the environment. By participating in these projects, they get to feel a little bit more ownership of the, their environment, their city. Uh, it was really important for them. This year, uh, we aren't able to work with them in person, but we are doing uh, some major surveys and they're doing some behind the scenes work that we just haven't gotten to do during those busy summer seasons, other years when they've been actively out in the field as much as possible. Uh, they actually get to take a step back and 
they're uh, working with us in other ways this year. So they uh, learned basic teaching techniques and they created their own activities is one of the uh, best parts that I got to be a part of that initial training for them and what they've been able to create has been really fun. And uh, the success rate of birds at Pleasure Beach has uh, risen since this program started. So it's one of our uh, favorite success stories at Audubon, Connecticut. So what can you do? I see someone asking about how they can get that job. Uh, one thing I wanted to share is that our colleagues at uh, Working on the Coast program have created the Share the Love, Share the Shore campaign this summer. That uh, for the beginning part of the nesting season, our staff and our volunteers were not able to work together and uh, or be in the field for a while because we just felt that traveling uh, across the state wasn't something that we should be doing at that time. Uh, so some local volunteers helped a bit, but we instead created this website and we will uh, share with you when we have the recording of this and we'll send a uh, follow up email to you. We'll send you a link to this website for Share the Love, Share the Shore. And there you can find examples of social media posts that you can share to be able to educate your network, your friends and family about why shorebirds are important and what we should be doing when we go and visit the beach this summer. Uh, there's also uh, examples of letters to the editor, if you're so inclined, that we've got the basic language there for you to use to be able to share that. And it's something that even for those of us in Hartford County, people are going to Hammonasset, they're going to Rocky Neck for the day. So it's important that all of our neighbors across Connecticut and the Northeast learn what we should do to help our beach nesting birds. And if you have any young ones in your life or you're so artistically inclined, uh, we are also looking for new artwork for our signs on the beaches. So there on the website, you'll see where you can email in your scans of the photos. You can also just posting them to our Instagram page is something that we're doing virtual uh, beach signage this year. So the more signs we have and sharing that idea out there. And for uh, the young ones in your life, we also have coloring pages that we've created the template. So it's got the bird and the kids get to come up with their own phrases of what they would like to say. Um, but they've got at least the right shape of the bird so they aren't so frustrated in trying to draw a least turn or a piping clover. Also in there, we have the chance for you to take your own Be A Good Egg Pledge. Uh, this program started to our south in North Carolina and was adopted in New York and New Jersey. And now in Connecticut, we're on our at least third, if not fourth year. Uh, uh, we've, some of our shorebird monitors are trained to staff a table on the busier weekends at our beaches and we share with everyone the basic pledge of the behaviors everyone should think of when we are visiting the beach. First and foremost is staying away from the fenced and marked areas uh, is important because we know that's where the birds are the most. Also, we know that any trash left behind and it's really toughy and tough, it's breezy at the beach. So whatever we can do to make sure that there is no trash left behind. And uh, another factor is making sure that we obey any no dogs allowed signs that uh, Audubon and our conservation partners have worked with our most important municipalities where there are these beach nesting birds to make sure their beaches have these ordinances uh, to protect our birds the most. One area that we've had success with this is uh, Sandy Point in West Haven. West Haven's a very popular beach town for the summer. And this is one of the most secluded beaches. It's the quietest beach because it's out a peninsula. So there we have volunteers right at the entryway. And uh, then it, all of those oyster catchers and the, I saw the least turns and are uh, setting up all the way out near the furthest tide line to the upper right is where they're actually setting up to nest the season when I was out there two weeks ago. So 
Thank you for your time this afternoon to hear about our beach nesting birds, which ones we have, some ways that you can support them this year. Uh, and uh, I do have one more story about oyster catchers to share with all of you. Uh, my screen will pop right over here. Is that I couldn't get this from our website into my PowerPoint earlier. But uh, one of our other projects with the American oyster catchers that we've had in Connecticut is that uh, one of our staffers, Beth Amendola, has been able to put a trail camera that you normally see for people watching for deer or raccoons in their backyard. She was able to put it on one of the string fencing posts so that she could watch this family of American oyster catchers. And this was out on uh, Kikini Island in Long Island Sound near Westport. And what happened was that here is the camera and you can see the oyster catcher sitting on the nest right there and it's nearly in the center of the frame. And then a storm came along the next day. The tides came up. It was quite an event that afternoon. And then the next day, she looked again at the cameras and the camera did not move, but the oyster catcher nest is now further over to the left. Remarkably, the young were incubated properly, they hatched, and this nest fledged two young, which is uh, one of the most productive nests in Connecticut when we consider that there were uh, 74 pairs and only 64 young fledged, uh, and these were two of them. That's uh, a great success story there. So these can be really uh, resilient animals if we give them the right space to be able to do that uh, and to be who they are and survive on their own. So I just wanted to share these, uh, and I'm gonna just leave that up since they're a remarkable story. Uh, and I will uh, open up for any questions from the group. So Jillian or uh, Kate, any questions? Okay. Mary asked, do you post signs in Spanish as well? Uh, we are working on that. Uh, and I do know of a few examples of it, but we haven't done it as uh, in as many beaches as we probably should. Uh, thank you for asking. I know that our handouts was something that, because uh, for the Be a Good Egg Pledge, I know those were translated because I had one of my friends help translate those about eight years ago or so. So we do have the print materials in Spanish, but the signage, I don't know if we've done yet. Great question. And um, I will see what we can do about that. I saw the one sign, um, I guess the one that was on the left of the screen at Pleasure Beach was in, mm -hmm. had a line in Spanish, like part of it was in Spanish um, too. So. Thanks, Julian. Yeah. More observant than me there. Jan would like to know where is West Beach? Uh, the West Beach, was that the West Haven Beach? The, um, that, uh, is that what she's referring to? I think so, and yeah. I might have referred to that, that it was on the um, photo there. That is uh, the west side of uh, New Haven Harbor, so it's in West Haven. Uh, it's actually called Beach Ave, and it's um, called Sandy Point or Morris Point, and then the beach is right next to it. Um, otherwise, West Beach, a lot of our, each individual town has sometimes a West Beach and an East Beach. Um, I'm thinking of Guilford and Madison having that scenario as well. Uh, Jillian has just placed the good, Be a Good Egg page uh, in the chat box, so you can actually click on that link yourself to be able to open that up on uh, your browser to uh, view as soon as we're done here in a few minutes. And uh, I, Barbara was asking about the, can she have an, a, a job like that on the beach uh, working as a monitor. 
we do have a few seasonal positions. It depends on funding every year. So we usually are hiring for those in January and February uh, because they start in March quite often that the first piping clovers and oyster catchers return to Connecticut's beaches, usually by St. Patrick's Day. Uh, so we need to be out there and watch where the pairs are pairing up. Uh, and usually by April 1st, they might be starting to put out string fencing in places. And I know that goes through the month of April. Uh, so we don't have many positions. Last year, there were 21 staff among our three organizations uh, for all of that work. And this year, I know we have less funding. So um, I think it's more like 15 staff at most this year to do all that work among all the different organizations. Lauren asks, are shorebirds more social than other birds because humans are close to them? Ah, uh, so some of them, the terns are quite social. And then the migratory shorebirds, like all the birds we refer to as peeps, the sandpipers and the black belly plovers uh, and the yellow legs, uh, they tend to flock together. Uh, during the nesting season, you, uh, will find things like the oyster catchers and plovers are territorial, so they will spread out. But just like northern cardinals during the breeding season right now, they're chasing each other out and there's only one pair in your yard probably. That's what it's like. But then during the winter, we can find large groups of plovers uh, together that we've, uh, Audubon's team has worked with the overwintering grounds. We found certain Ks uh, in the Bahamas are where our piping plovers are overwintering. And so there we can find a hundred of them in one relatively tight group. Uh, it's not just for uh, being near humans. The reason for flocking together is protection from other predators, in particular pipe, uh, peregrine falcons, that the falcons are overstimulated. They can't pick out one animal in particular to chase. So I've seen them go through a large flock of birds and they've missed every single one of them because they couldn't focus on just one of them. So that is, uh, uh, it is a protection behavior, but not just because of the humans. Jan asks, is there land access to Pleasure Beach? Pleasure Beach is the peninsula past Stratford's Long Beach. So you need to be able to park at Stratford Long Beach and walk that section, but the parking is for Stratford residents only during this, uh, during the, the warm months of the year. During the winter, you can use that parking lot, but not during uh, the more busy beach months. Uh, and also it is a multi-mile walk from the Long Beach parking lot all the way out to Pleasure Beach and back. Um, for example, I know someone does that for the Christmas bird count. That is their only assignment for the entire day uh, is to walk from that parking lot all the way out and around Long, uh, Pleasure Beach and back. So um, it can be done. I know I've done it myself, but it's, a, it's quite a walk. And instead the water taxis are uh, pretty accessible. They're down near the ferry landing. Uh, or Port Jeff in Bridgeport. So there's ample parking for visitors and uh, it's a um, great opportunity if you can use that. Well, thank you everyone. Uh, it's a gray Friday afternoon, but uh, you brightened up my day away from my other tasks at hand. So I'm glad I was able to share with all of you this afternoon. And uh, hopefully I've inspired a few of you to take that be a good egg pledge or share this information with your friends and family visiting the beaches this summer as well. I'll stick around for another moment or two if anyone else has any questions. Uh, I can open it up that you can unmute yourself at this point as well because I'll stop the recording. Uh, but yes.